Paul Krugman isn't typically thought of as a development economist in the narrow sense, but his work has had a big impact on how people think about economic development. So we're not going to give you an overview of Krugman's entire career, either as an academic or writing for the New York Times, but we'll look just at a few of his ideas which relate particularly to economic development. One of Krugman's core economic ideas is the notion that specialization is an important motive for trade, and in particular international trade. The more dominant theory of comparative advantage, which we cover in another video unit under that title, stresses the idea that in relative terms, one person may be more productive at doing something than another person, and therefore the two parties should do different things in trade. That's all fine and well, but specialization is a somewhat different motivation for trade. That is, even if two people at first were equally productive in all endeavors, if the two would specialize over time, each would become more productive doing something, and it would then make sense for them to specialize and trade. Of all the writers on international trade, Krugman is probably the one who gives the clearest and most insightful explanation of how the specialization motive for trade differs from the comparative advantage motive for trade. Krugman also has written a great deal about increasing returns, and this notion of increasing returns holds in a number of contexts. For instance, a firm may become more productive as it becomes larger, and that means that larger markets will tend to support the most productive firms, but also there can be increasing returns from clustering a lot of economic activity in a given region. For instance, that region might be a city. Krugman, in general, has done a lot to refocus the attention of economists on economic geography and the importance of place, and that also means the importance of the economic role of cities, because cities can lead to increasing returns to scale, and they can encourage economic specialization and make individuals more productive. So if we're asking big-picture questions about how do these features fit together, like where you put economic activity, what's the importance of a city, what happens to productivity as firms cluster and their activities scale up in terms of size, and how does this affect specialization? Well, Krugman is the writer who probably has done the most to tie together these different ideas in an appealing and accessible framework. In terms of concrete economic issues, Krugman offered a very early and very clear discussion of how a governmental trade policy can improve welfare. Think back to this notion of increasing returns to scale. Some firms become much more productive as they operate with a larger number of units being produced. A classic example given by Krugman would be Boeing and Airbus, the world's two leading makers of large planes. They're each very productive, but they become productive by making a large number of planes based on some kind of fixed base of capacity for output, and a company that tried to be as productive but making, say, only a few planes per year couldn't possibly succeed. So we know there'll be a small number of firms making planes. If you have a lot of experience making a lot of planes, you will be more productive. And that then at least potentially gives rise to the notion that if there's some kind of government policy that encourages the making of planes in your region, and if your region has the potential to succeed at making those planes, well, this can make your country wealthier by giving you a kind of first-mover advantage and helping you take advantage of those economies of scale for making a lot of different planes at a high level of output. Krugman himself always stressed, however, that although this was a theoretical argument for why government intervention might improve domestic welfare, that he thought in practice free trade was generally the best idea, that the notion that governments might get strategic trade policy wrong because of bad information or because of the influence of special interest groups and corruption, or simply the notion that if one government starts strategic trade policy, another government will retaliate. And for all of those reasons, Krugman gave both a good theoretical argument for why strategic trade policy might work, but also very good practical arguments why, in the actual real world, we are usually ill-advised to attempt strategic trade policy. When it comes to economic geography, Krugman wrote a seminal piece on why it is that manufacturing firms tend to cluster near high demand and why those clusters of manufacturing firms over time tend to develop high productivity. If you're analyzing an issue like, well, why is so much economic activity shifting to China and East Asia, Krugman's work in this area is considered quite important. 
In the 1990s, Krugman was known as being somewhat of a skeptic about the so-called Asian economic miracle. Krugman pointed out, also in his popular writings, that some of the Asian economic miracle, it just came from accumulating a lot of factors and throwing a lot of labor at the problem and having a lot of labor migrating from rural areas to cities. So Krugman, looking forward, wondered how well the Asian economic miracle would hold up, and Krugman also was an important analyst of the Asian currency crises of the late 1990s. Krugman has some very well-known writings on the idea of debt forgiveness and optimal debt policies toward nations which owe money. One of the ideas which Krugman put forward is that sometimes a creditor is better off with some debt forgiveness that is asking for less rather than more, that if someone is really underwater when it comes to their debt and the creditor asks for the whole thing back, well, the country or the firm or the individual underwater doesn't really have the incentive to take activities that would increase more value because that individual firm or country knows that entire value is going all to the creditor. So sometimes less is more, and Krugman put forward this argument for partial debt forgiveness. Krugman also has important papers on exchange rate volatility and currency crises. Those are not central topics in this course, but you can Google to them and read them. Part of Krugman's analysis was the first systematic contemporary attempt to figure out how it is that currency crises happen and how it is that a country can have a currency crisis based not just on fundamentals, but in part a currency crisis as a self-fulfilling prophecy. There's so much on Paul Krugman and by Paul Krugman, it's hard to know where to start, uh, but here's some very important tips. Uh, the first is that a lot of Paul Krugman's later writings, they concern politics and they're very controversial, and a lot of people really like him a lot, and a lot of people really don't like him at all, and the important thing is to put those feelings and disputes aside and focus on Krugman's substantive contributions to economics. But part of the problem is there's so much on Krugman and Google, it can be hard to kind of cut through that mess and get to the best stuff. If you'd like to read about Krugman's contributions to international trade theory, I very much recommend an essay by Avinash Dixit, and Google Avinash Dixit in honor of Paul Krugman. That's really a great piece. Also, Paul Antras and Nathan Nunn have done up some slides on topics in international trade, and they cover Krugman's work and how it relates to earlier ideas, and those are excellent and very clear and they give you a very good sense of what Krugman has done in international trade theory. Also, you can enter Paul Krugman in scholar.google.com. That will get you to the academic papers and bring you around the political disputes. There's something called the unofficial Paul Krugman webpage, which has a large number of Krugman's writings, including his popular writings. Uh, there's a Twitter account, which will link you to his columns and blog posts. That's at newyorktimes.krugman. That tends not to be about development economics, but sometimes it is. And then, of course, you can Google to the blog, which Paul Krugman writes for the New York Times. So there's a lot there. Uh, have fun. But I would really stress the importance of those first two items to get you to Krugman's economic contributions, the Avinash Dixit piece, and the slides by Paul Antras and Nathan Nunn.